Hello, welcome everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome and happy 2022. Happy, happy 2022. Happy new year to all of you. It is wonderful to see you coming in. Do shout out for us in the chat where you're coming from. Has your new year been so far? It's awesome to gather here together in still the early part of January. My name is Dr. Shamini Jan. I'm the founder and CEO of the Consciousness and Healing Initiative. And we are absolutely thrilled to bring leaders in healing to you every month during these webinars, webinars on healing, where we learn about the best of the science and the best of healing practice from leaders in the field. We're so, so grateful that you've come to join us here live. It's wonderful. And for those of you who will be watching the replay later, welcome. And thank you for tuning in. Uh, do let us know where you're coming from. I see San Jose. I see Long Beach, Chino Hills, a lot of Californians today, Seattle, Brooklyn, Columbia, Napa. Fabulous. Ibiza, Spain. Yes. Portland. My goodness. Portugal. This is amazing. Thank you. Worldwide community. I hope your 2022 has been going very well, that everyone has been keeping Yucatan. Fabulous that you've been keeping healthy and in good spirit. And you know, while we're all navigating the unknown and uh, the continued pandemic, that even if you haven't been feeling great, that you've been keeping in good spirit as much as possible. It is my honor and pleasure to have our guest for this January webinar, 2022, Grace Sesma Curandera, proud, part of the Chi Healing Practitioners Council and lifelong educator with us. And Grace is gonna bring us in together in ceremony before we begin. Grace, thank you so much for being with us. Oh, Shami, thank you so much for inviting me to, to be with you, to be in circle with everyone who's, who's just joining us. And uh, I want to acknowledge that I am coming to you from the land of the Arapaho, relatives, Lakota relatives, Cheyenne, and you peoples in Colorado. And I appreciate all, all the guardians who have welcomed me into, into this beautiful land up here in the Rockies. I'm just lighting some uh, sage and some tobacco so that uh, we can start our, our platica in a good way with, uh, with prayers and, and setting the intention for our time together to be one that is, is good for everyone, that is a blessing for everyone. And so creator, grandmothers and grandfathers of the four directions, to all you good doctor spirits and all you good spirits in nature, I offer you this sacred medicine in gratefulness for this day and gratefulness for our life gratefulness for this beautiful plant medicine. May it flow out to the four directions to bless all those who are joining us today or who will be joining us later through this recording. I call upon your wisdom and your strong spiritual protection for all of us here. Call upon all of our ancestors that they may stand behind us and may guide us May they surround us with their love. May their wisdom flow through us. May their good medicine power flow through us to heal ourselves and each other. I thank you for this opportunity to be in this platica with my relatives. And I ask that this, that this conversation, that this sharing of ours be a blessing to all of, all of you who are listening, all of you who have joined us. I thank you, Creator, for all these blessings and the blessings yet to come. And I offer these blessings for all our relatives in nature, for all our guardians, for all of our ancestors, for all of us present and all those yet to come. Thank you for, uh, thank you for joining me in your heart with those prayers too. Thank you, Grace. What a beautiful way to start off our first webinar of 2022 with that very, very graceful and beautiful prayer. Thank you. 
it's an honor to have you with us to talk about curanderismo. And sadly, though we are on native land, many of us don't really know what it is, right? Some of us joining may have some familiarity, but others may not. So maybe we can start at the very beginning, which is if someone who knows nothing about curanderismo comes to you and asks you, what is this that you practice? And how is it that you found yourself to become a curandera? How would you answer that? Well, <clears throat> so I don't know whether to start with my, my personal story of how I Please. got on this path, because it's, it's really long, so I'm gonna have to try and abbreviate it. Otherwise, we will go into two or three hours for this talk. Um, my calling to walk this path of curanderismo came through my dreams as a very young child. And the earliest dream that I remember is probably when I was six or seven and I was asleep. Um, and we come from a very humble family. I was born in Mexicali, Baja California, the capital of Baja California, and one of probably one of the top three poorest communities. Uh, so it was very rich in love, but we're you know very quite poor. My parents uh, built their casita out of adobe themselves, and it was filled with love and laughter and the presence of extended family that most of my aunts and uncles live within a couple of blocks of each other. And so I was exposed to curanderismo, not that I knew that it was called that. In those days, it was just, you know, our family practicing certain cultural uh, rituals that helped, helped keep us healthy. And we used to talk about dreams but again, it was something that's very normal, very natural. It's nothing like perhaps that we read in books. And so we consider ourselves to be a very much of a dreaming family. Mm -hmm. And when I was six or seven, uh, we were, um, I had to roll out a little cot that my sister and I shared. And I was fast asleep, but I was aware that this beautiful woman walked into the room and she came over to the cot and she extended her hand to me. And she said, Mijita, will you come with me? And she was beautiful. So I said, yes. And she lifted me out of the cot. Of course, that was my spiritual body. Mm -hmm. And we walked out of our house and it seemed that I, I walked into a, um, a carriage of some sort. She sat to my left and I kept looking up at her because she was just so beautiful. And she was wearing a, a rebozo. She was wearing it over her head. And as she was speaking to me, what I recall even now is the mystery of seeing pinpoints of light in her rebozo like stars. Mm. Her rebozo was a beautiful dark indigo. And, to, and I think it was the, the night sky and it was the stars that, that her rebozo was adorned with. So she was adorned with the night sky. And I don't recall her words verbatim. I just remember that she asked me, if I would accept what she was going to ask me to do, if I would say yes, if I would follow her her instructions. And you were seven I, years old at this time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is yeah. all happening in the in the dream, dream. in the dream yeah. time, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Wow. And I remember her talking to me and I would kept going like, okay, yes, yes, of course, okay. And just knowing in my heart that I had to say yes. I don't remember again, the, what she asked me to do, but I knew that it had to do with, with my life. And as I grew older, that stuck with me. And I knew 
that somehow that would unfold. Wow, you that's so, so beautiful. And um, <clears throat> so to me, that was the first, the first uh, call to walk on this path. And as I got older, more assimilated, I, I didn't want to be on this path. I had seen my, one of my aunties who was a curandera uh, for our neighborhood, how much she worked. She worked very hard. She was very humble. She, I don't recall her um, charging people, but um, I knew that it was a very arduous path and I didn't want to do this. I had, I got, uh, I got married at age 16, divorced at 19. So I had two daughters to support. And wow. I didn't feel that this, that I would be able to support my family by, by turning to the medicine. But through a series of dreams of grandmothers coming to see me in, in the dream time, giving me teachings, chastising me, um, I was forced to walk on this path eventually. Mm. Uh, because they told me that if I didn't, I would lose my job. I had a well-paying job at the time and that I would lose everything. My. And um, I tried to negotiate with them over the years. And finally, <laughs> the time when they said, no, you need to, you need to start learning this. And um, so I decided to just wait off, hold off a little bit more on that. And before I knew it, I, at that time, I was the administrator for a psychiatric partial hospitalization program mm -hmm. and the hospital closed down and um, I was out of work for a few months. I was unable to make my mortgage payment or my car payment. So I lost everything. Wow. It was a terrible, terrible time. And then I got a dream and said, if you walk this path, the medicine, not Reiki or those other things, but the medicine, you will always be taken care of. And um, so I said, okay. And within a month I had work and I was introduced to elders that, that begin guiding me in, in this, in the reality, in this reality. Hmm. So that's a very abbreviated version of, of how I came to walk this path. And that was over a course, obviously of, of many, many years of several decades. Thank you so much for sharing even this abbreviated story with us, because first of all, it's so beautiful. And, and second does remind me of, of the healers calling, you know, and often the healers, many healers that I have met have related somewhat similar stories of the calling and sometimes the, res the reluctance, you know, in the beginning to follow yeah. that calling and, you know, clear messages sometimes as you received of this is what's going to happen. This is why you need to do it. This is just part of who you are and your purpose. And yeah. I so appreciate you sharing the story because I think it's, it's so important. As you know, we live in a very Western world where there are many things that are commercially available to us, right? Many ways yeah. of teaching healing, bringing healing. And these ways and the ways in particular, let's say of curanderismo, the calling to be a curandera is a little bit different, say, than taking a weekend workshop, for example, you know, it's a totally different process. Yeah. So let's, let's take a, let's take a kind of a, you know, a perspective here so that we all really understand what is curanderismo and, and how might it be similar or different from some of the healing traditions that we see in the modern world? Maybe they're not as different. Maybe there's some similarities, but any way that you would like to describe, you know, what curanderismo really is? Curanderismo is very culture specific. It's specific to Mexican culture. It is my practice. <clears throat> um, and it's, and it incorporates aspects of native cultures of Mexico. Today, um, many curanderas, um, curandera apprentices are also bringing in some Northern native traditions because they're very similar. Some of our practices are very similar. Our prayers are similar. Uh, the practice of our platicas, our heart to heart conversations, that aspect of what we call counseling is is part of most native um, healing traditions as well. 
Mm. Um, we use, of course, feathers. We use our songs. We use other um, other traditional um, sacred tools. But curanderismo as a whole is seen as an interwoven um, practice of bringing people back to their inherent wellness and balance. And it sounds like, oh yeah, this is what we're gonna do. You know, and it's like almost magic, but that's not my intention. Healing takes time, it is a journey. And so a lot of people I think, think of curanderismo native healing practices as something that's magical or that is going to happen overnight after Alimbia. But for many people, it's a process, it's a journey. We're like an onion, we're peeling and unpeeling layers. Um, <clears throat> and then there's the energy component, you know, this, we call it spiritual healing. Some people call it energy healing, it's, it's similar, except that um, I think for practitioners of strictly energy healing, they may look at it as very scientific and it doesn't have the spiritual religious underpinning that our tradition has. Um, for us, creator, our connection to creator, our connection to the land, our, creation, our relationship with plants, our relationships um, with certain uh, of our tools, we, we nurture that relationship, our relationship with each other. All of it's, we're a team versus one person. Mm, I love that. Yeah. Is it safe to say that Renderismo, um, <clears throat> similar to other traditions and other cultures, come from a cosmology of connection? So that we yes. recognize, like you say, we're not alone. It's not just you, the curandera. You're like an, an agent. You're connected to creator. You're connected to ancestral um, lineage of, of helping guides and spirits, these types of things, mm -hmm. yours and, mm -hmm. and the person you're working with. So there is an interaction that's taking place. And that restoration, as you said, of that inner wellness is also that sense of harmony with oneself and one's you know, relatives and, you know, meaning the relatives of the earth as well. Yes, and, right. and all beings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All beings. Yes. It's such a beautiful, beautiful system. So you, as you mentioned, were the system isn't even the right word, you know, in, in other words, you know, I know. And I you said it just for word, a scientific <laughs> term. <laughs> yeah. Used, that's for ease of communication, but yeah. It's a beautiful way, really, is probably a better better way to describe it. And, and you described your own calling. So now, you know, you practice this, you've been practicing this for decades and you've been teaching people and you work with people. What do you look for, you know, in a student, if someone wants to learn curanderismo and become a curandera, for example, mm -hmm. how does that process work? <clears throat> well, it's to become uh, in a, a formal apprentice is very arduous for both, for both the student and the teacher because the teacher is a mirror. My primary elder was a, a mirror for me of both my, what people might say is the shadow, as well as the gifts that um, have been given to me. And it's, it's a process, it's a, it's a relationship building. So we both have to be patient with each other the student has to be patient with themselves. They have to be willing um, to work through relationship issues mm -hmm. with the teacher. They have to be willing to hear no and act on the no. Um, in the Western way, most people are not used to receiving a no. Uh, you know, uh, may I excuse myself for just a moment? I'm seeing that there's a problem with um, the connection. I'm going to Power? stop. Yeah, you. absolutely. Do what you need to do. And in the meantime, yeah. while you're doing that, I'll just uh, I'll just chat with our group here, our audience. Okay. Thank you all again for being with us. We've got so many of you coming from all over the world. While Grace is just making sure that her power is set up well on the computer, um, I noticed some wonderful comments and things in chat. If you're new to us, 
we will be having some time for you to ask Grace some questions about curanderismo and, and her process as a curandera. And we're gonna be sharing some practices and things as well today. But if you do have a question for Grace, if you're joining us here on Zoom, just look to the bottom of your screen and you'll see a button that says q and I want you to just um, press that button and type in your question and we will get to them um, toward the end of the hour so that you can have a few questions with Grace. And, you know, we're lucky we'll get to have her back, of course, to share even more wisdom. Uh, she is part of our Healing Practitioners Council for the Consciousness and Healing Initiative, which is sponsoring our webinar here today. So um, do go ahead and put your questions in the chat if you'd like to ask a question later. Grace, you're, you're all good? You're connected? Yes, you're, uh, yes you're, it was just kind of wobbly. So uh, yeah. now it's back on, so I feel more comfortable. Now I was beginning to, to wonder what was going on. But so, <laughs> so let's go back to what we were talking about, the student um, relation, what I look for in a student. So um, for me, it's really important that we have a spiritual connection. I dreamed of all of my teachers before I ever met them. Mm, my teachers wow. dreamed of me. So that, I mean, not that that has to happen, but I'm using that as an example of a strong spiritual connection. So there, we have to feel there's a spiritual connection. Also, I think it's really important for students or people who want to learn from any teacher to look at their background, uh, you know, be respectful, but ask questions. Are they ethical? Um, how do they carry themselves? Are they walking their talk? That's really important to me. What are, what are their ethics? What are their values? Um, how do they treat their students? It's one thing, uh, like some of my students uh, say, I, my, it's like you're, it's like, a like you're like someone who's scolding. I do it out of love because I want them to do well. I want them to, to be better than me. I think that's the goal of most teachers is that you hope that the, the, the people that you're sharing with, your medicine with, that they're going to be much better than you. Mm. So, you know, and that's also part of a test, I think, for students. If I say, no, you can't do this, and they behave inappropriately, that tells me that they lack discipline. And so mm. they have to work on the discipline. I had to learn that discipline. So because, humility, uh, this humility yeah. discipline, integrity, all these things are crucial, a willingness to come into relationship with you and, and, and grow. And, and it sounds like, yeah, there is some shadow work that is going to come up <laughs> in this process that yeah. people have to be ready to, to go through that. And, and as you say, lead with, lead with, I'm hearing a lot of humility, uh, discipline and, and uh, integrity in the process. Mm -hmm. And I love how yeah. you noted that um, in this tradition, in your tradition, that uh, understanding the no of the teacher and really trusting in the guidance of a teacher, you know, in our tradition, we talk about gurus and, and that, you know, it to some degree has a bad name, yeah. you know, in the Western world, especially and in the world generally because of so-called false gurus, you know, just as an aside, I had a good friend once that said, you know what guru means to me, G-U-R-U right? G, you were you. Because a guru's place is to lead you back to your essence, right? And that is what I'm hearing from you as well, is that you have to, there's a sense of trust and surrender too, in the guide, right? That they have, a curandera that is training with you will have to have that trust and faith in you as well, to, mm -hmm. to guide through the process. Yes. And it's, and you know, every teacher is different. So I'm not as tough a teacher uh, so far, as uh, my elders have been with me, because <clears throat> I don't see many uh, persons who are really willing to to discover certain things about the medicine and the training. I, I think they would be very fearful. They might misunderstand certain things. So. I still look at that and you have to adapt to your student. And so, and also not everyone is supposed to be a curandera or a curandero. Um, and I'd like to say that even though I use the binary curandero and curandera, I include all my relatives of, of the spectrum and their gender identity. When mm. I say, when I use those words, 
Thank you for, um, for naming that. Yeah, so, yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah that is, one, yeah. sorry, please. No, so as one example, uh, my elder, one time we were going on pilgrimage and um, had a big group. And I was standing about halfway down the block with his daughter. And she and I were just laughing and um, not really paying attention when all of a sudden I felt someone's energy hand reach into my heart and give it a little bit of a squeeze. And so immediately I started putting up my, my defenses and thinking like, who is this? And then I recognized the, the energetic signature as my elders. And I looked and he was at the other corner and he had his arms crossed and he's looking at me with this, like disgust. <laughs> Because I am supposed to always be aware of my surroundings. I'm supposed to be aware of my energy and my energetic boundaries. And so that's a really hard lesson. And there was, and those he applied those kind of lessons to other people on that trip. And when they came back, they never returned to, to spend time with him. Mm, wow. That's a, yeah. that's a beautiful. Thank you for sharing that experience. You know, and you mentioned that it, it's not for everyone, right? So you may be interested in this and you may support it, you know, but yeah. that's different from doing it. And there's, there is something about, you know, what you call being a good relative. And you've talked about that. You've even, um, you know, given classes on what it means to be a good relative. How do you become a good relative? So tell us about that. Why did you do a class on being a good relative and what does it mean to be a good relative? To me, to be a good relative, first of all, there has to be mutual respect. Um, there has to be reciprocity. There has to be a sense of that what happens to me is going to happen to you. A blessing for me is a blessing for you. What harms me harms you. That's, that's part of being a good, a good relative in general. But the way I, when I talk about this in this, the class that I do, it's a little bit farther. Uh, it, it's more for the non-native people or native Mexican people who have been removed from cultural ways because of colonization. And so we have to come back to learn what that means for us. So being a good relative to me, if you're not of my culture, means respecting my protocols respecting our boundaries. You don't grasp at teachings and cultural rituals just because you have the, that you can. Um, you don't take without asking as happens a lot, unfortunately. There's a lot of people out there who feel that cultural practices like curanderismo and Native American medicines ways are there at their disposal and they're entitled to the teachings. And because elders have been kind and compassionate and have shared teachings with them, without spending more time with these elders, they decide to um, set themselves up as shaman, uh, as teachers, and they, there's instances of people that I met, who I have met, that have exploited the teachings that they've received. They've trademarked it and changed some things, but they're clearly very culture specific teachings. Mm. And they make a lot of money catering to the needs of people who feel a void in their spirit in their spiritual life. And that to me is theft. It's part of the ongoing genocide of our culture. Some people don't do it maliciously. It's not malicious, it's ignorance because no one has told them that it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And so I wanna tell you that it's wrong and I wanna tell you why it's wrong. I wanna share with you how to do things right um, how to go beyond just being, uh, offering a land acknowledgement, for example, to be a good ally. 
how to determine what's the difference between uh, native medicine ways and the protocols, uh, such as not charging for healing. For most native nations, you don't charge for healing, but we see people who are charging $500 an hour for healing. So this medicine is for the people. It's not supposed to be exploited and desacralized. And that is what happens when people don't, don't, have, uh, uh, don't have the experience and haven't be, been taught about our collective history in the Americas, about European colonization of the murder of millions of native peoples. I hope that after they attend this class that they will respect the teachings, that they will respect the sacrifice that many of our ancestors have made, did make um, in preserving and, and our traditions and hiding some of our cosmology so that today we can still put it together and be able to, to reconnect with our cultural ways and to revitalize our language. These are all things that a lot of people don't seem to know. Um, I've had conversations with very kind-hearted people who are call themselves shaman and disagree with me that they are stealing cultural practices from native nations because they've gone through courses that they get a certificate for. And so when I ask them, okay, so break down what you are doing. Tell me where you got this practice. Can you tell me where, who's, to whose nation this belongs? Where did this originate, what you're doing? They don't know. They just know they went to a shamanic course and now they can drum. Now they can whistle um, or do other things, but they don't know that these practices have been whitewashed. They've been usually taken from native elders without any reciprocity, without authority from them. So they don't understand that it, they're still being complicit in that cultural theft. Mm. They don't even know that yeah. up until 1978, all of these practices were illegal. Our ancestors were jailed and murdered. They were killed for these practices. And now you feel that it's your, you're entitled to them without working for them, without earning your the teachings and that's really important you've got to earn what you learn i and love that that earning, that earning comes over decades not in two-week courses or a seven-week course or a one-year course and you don't get certificates i don't have a single certificate my certificate is my community's support that's my oh. certificate. Oh, I, I just love this. And we're getting so much love right now in the chat. Everyone is thanking you for speaking this beautiful and very important truth in a time that, you know, we really need this. Cultural appropriation is very real. We see it in all over in many traditions and certainly so much in this tradition. And as you know, Grace, and we'll be sharing with all of you all later on um, with our Qi communications, issues related to certification and licensing, for example, of healing practitioners and the need to be very vocal from the you know, First Nations and other communities about how they really feel about that. Because when you're coming from a tra healing tradition, where you just, it's not about monetization and it's not about certification and things like that. We have to find a way to honor these practices in right way and in right relationship and as allies. So thank you for speaking that truth. And, you know, I just want to share a personal experience actually that I had recently where um, I went to a, a sort of a Native American cultural gathering here. Um, in South Carolina, where I live currently, right? And, and it was beautiful. And it was a time that 
um, people from that community invited the public to come and gather and learn. And so, you know, we learned so much. And I remember sitting and watching the dancing in this case, you know, there's just all this, this beautiful dancing that was taking place. And even for me coming from a very rich heritage, you know, tradition that I love and that I do feel very connected to, it was interesting because I felt myself sort of almost yearning because the culture is so yeah. beautiful. The practices are so beautiful and they all, each of these practices speak to our spirit, right? So let's own that, that when we are, when we are attracted to something, whether we perceive it to be in or out of our culture, we're attracted to it perhaps because it lifts our spirit. And as Westerners, mm -hmm. we have to remember that that doesn't mean we have to own it, <laughs> that we don't, right. you know, right? That we don't, it's not, it's, it's okay to say, I can witness this. It's absolutely beautiful and it's not mine. And then, you know, it was interesting. So I watched myself go through this process. And then later they invited us to come and do a friendship dance. Oh. And it was so emotional for me. I get emotional now just even talking about it, right? Because then to come into that space as an ally, as a true ally, to witness the beauty, you know, of a tradition and all its richness and, and, and for all the reasons that you said, we cannot separate the cultural context of colonialism from this issue. We just cannot. And anyone who tries to do that, it's a total bypass. And we have to recognize that's a bypass. So you have to take all that in. And what's beautiful is that we can be touched by the beauty and wisdom of these practices as allies. We don't have to always be on the inside circle of everything <laughs> to That's receive right. the benefit, yeah. right? And, and so yeah. I think it's important for all of us to learn that as we learn about our different traditions and we learn about our different cultures, that we can celebrate that mm -hmm. and release the and sense that of- that should be the owner. impetus for saying, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. No, that's it. Yeah, that's, I just wanted to share uh, that, you know, yeah, reflect. That's beautiful because I, I've had that feeling with other cultures as well, yeah. you know, and. Uh, but I think in particular with native cultures, because of the damage that has, the harm that has been done by colonization, the, if you're not of that culture, if you love it so much, you appreciate it so much, the, the, the question should be, how can I support them? How can I support you? Ask that nation, I wanna be a, an ally. How can I support you? What, do I, what can I do from, from my, from my, where I am at to support you? Are you doing language revitalization programs? How can I support that? Are you protecting your lands from developers? So can I go stand with you behind you as you stand there to face off against these developers because your ancestors are buried here and I'm gonna stand with you. That's, that's part of it. Mm, I love it's not that. about taking yeah. anymore. It's about, you know, it's about showing compassion and love for each other and doing it in a way that supports one another without needing to take. Yeah, thank you. That is so beautiful. And 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 to bear witness to something that is beautiful, you you shared with me that you were interested in actually sharing a practice with us today, right? That, you know, that this is something that we get to enjoy and experience with you, right? Without having to learn, need to, you know, dive in and feel like we have to own it or experience it, that you and, and people of your tradition will sometimes decide that you would like to share a practice with us share something with us that maybe we can do and and that is appropriate for us to do so thank you so much for that offer and i'm wondering if you'd like to say more about this practice you want to share with us yeah and and, and before i before i go into that i want to i want to say that many of us really do want to share with everyone our circles want to be open to everyone and part of that though there has to be that that trust that when you come into our circles, you're coming for help. You're not coming to copy. You're not coming to make notes about how you're gonna take it into your energy healing practices because that has happened to me and to other, other curanderas where energy practitioners or other type of shamanic healers will, will make appointments for healing, but they, once they get there, it's obvious that they're there to pick up a new tool for their toolbox. Mm -hmm. You know, so I would like to share with people with 
the understanding that what I shared, that you're going to use it for yourself, that you're going to use it with respect, that you're not going to change it arbitrarily, um, that you're not going to monetize it. One of the things that, that comes up a lot in groups and that I've um, been writing about on my Facebook because I think it's really important is Dia de Muertos. Mm. People love, love our holy days known as Dia de Muertos, Day of the Dead. Um, and some people were saying like, why are you writing about this? Why are you making it um, so public? The reason is because people are very disconnected from their ancestors. That's part of the problem that I'm seeing in this grasping at traditions that don't belong to you. If you were connected to your ancestors, if you were taught to respect and love your ancestors, you would want to learn about their practices. If your ancestors are from Ireland, beautiful tradition, beautiful, powerful healing traditions, start there. And they say, well, it's because I don't know. I want to honor my, my ancestors. She said, wonderful. Let me show you how to do it and do it correctly. We want to share with you, but we want you to do it with the same love and respect that we have for our traditions. So when I share like the herbal bath, uh, the full moon is coming up on Monday. So every month I remind uh, the people on my Facebook page, on my social media, that it's time for them to purify themselves through either a ritual healing bath and that uh, those instructions, the recipe, if you will, is on my website. Um, and maybe Jason can... just posted it in chat. So for anybody who wants Thank to see, just click the link that Jason just posted in chat for uh, the written version that Grace has provided us for the yeah. Libya. And it's there in English and in Spanish uh, for those who uh, want to share it with uh, people who only read Spanish. But um, so when, what, if you don't want to spend a lot of time with the bathing, which I really recommend if you feel very burdened by worries, um, if you have had, uh, you know, trauma from COVID is real. Uh, the disconnection that many of us are feeling is very real. Um, a certain impatience at times with ourselves and others because we, we feel the stress. If that feels very heavy for you, then instead of the moonlight limpia that I'm going to share with you for today, I really recommend that you take the time today to look at the, uh, uh, the herbal bath because you have to gather things for it. Mm. And there, it's, it's, it's quite lengthy. So you prepare now for Monday. Great. And Jason just posted that too. Full moon plant medicine purification. So you've got two links there from Jason um, to check out both aspects of this purification process. And so the moonlight limpia is very simple. And it's, um, <clears throat> I like it because you can bring your family into this ritual. The moonlight, the moonlight purification meditation is on the full moon or anytime that there's a lot of, that the grandmother moon is really shining brightly is, is the good time to, to do it. You can start today. When the moon is, you know, as high as, as, as above you as possible, you go outdoors if it's, not cold. If it's if it's very cold, like I here in the Rockies, uh, I I will do it inside, but preferably outside because you want the grandmother's light to flow over you. Culturally, we offer we stand outside and we first offer tobacco. There's a lot of cultural protocols around offering tobacco that really need to be explained properly. So I, I recommend that if you're not familiar with the indigenous protocols, especially for women on handling tobacco, that you use another plant like uh, mugwort, for example, you can use that 
for prayers. And you offer that plant medicine to the grandmother moon. And you know, you, you stand and you speak to her. She's your grandmother. She loves you. She wants the best for you. She wants to light your path. So you stand under the light of the grandmother moon. You offer your prayers. And if you're in a circle with your family, I encourage you to have your children offer their prayers to in a circle. Go around the circle. And each one offer their prayer. It can be short. It can even be a one word if, if someone is shy. Mm -hmm. But you stand in that circle together, offering your prayers. And you know, just ask, you know, Grandmother Moon, we thank you for your light. We thank you for that high spiritual light that flows through me and around me. I ask that your light remove from my body, mind, and spirit all inner and outer obstacles to my well-being. I ask that you light flow through every part of my body inside and out so that every part that is touched by your spiritual light be healed. I am willing to, to surrender my grief to you. I'm willing to surrender my doubts to you. I'm willing to surrender the connections that I have that are unhealthy to situations, friends, family members. I ask that you remove them and that your love bring us back together in happy and healthy ways so that we support one another and that our family can be whole and happy and harmonious in our relationships. Grandmother, I ask that you bless all our plant relatives, all our four-legged relatives. I ask that you bless all of our land and our water protectors, all, all those who are protecting our holy places, all those who are protecting the water, just like the water that runs through our body. This water is pristine, we ask that this water always flow for future generations. And so that's just an example. Use your own words. Sometimes people ask me, can you send me a prayer? And <laughs> yes, I can send you a prayer, but the prayer has to come from your heart. The prayer has, you know, and this is a conversation that you're having with the grandmother moon. You can even step aside of you by yourself and just really talk to her and just, Mm. Say it in all, whatever words you want. Mm. That's the important thing, is that you make that heart connection. And when you feel like you're done, you just say, thank you. Thank you for all the blessings. And I offer these blessings also for the benefit of all our relations. And that's what you do. <laughs> And I'd like to also recommend that if you're in a group, either with friends or family, that after the moonlight meditation, visualization, that you share food. That's really important. Oh, beautiful, yes. Because, you know, food is important to us. It's love. It's, it's also for us, it's cultural food. So that's part of, of, of continuing that ceremony. And you mean sharing food with each other in this case? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I ask because sometimes in, in our traditions, we offer food to the moon and during certain rituals, you know, not often, yes. but sometimes. Well, just yeah, clear. we do that too, but I want to keep it simple. Yeah. Okay, great. Gosh, yeah. Everyone, yeah, you can. everyone is throwing out so much love and gratitude for sharing oh, that practice. Thank you. thank you. They're all saying, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for your patience. We have many, many questions. We will not get through them all in the last 10 minutes. But I promise you that I will ask Grace if she will come back for us um, sometime as well. And we will also be putting the links to Grace's website and ways that you can be in contact with her for your continued learning with her as well. Um, so <laughs> Anne is asking, are you going to teach in San Diego again soon? <laughs> <laughs> I sure hope so, because I miss teaching in person. But I, I, uh, I do offer some classes through Zoom. I generally only share them with my subscriber list. Um, 
So, you know, subscribe to my email list and you'll get notices of when I, I, I teach these classes. The only one that I usually publicize on social media is my uh, good relations class, how to be a good relative class. Cause I think that that's really important. And I encourage everyone to participate and ask questions. And I try to make it as safe as possible so that you can ask any question that you want to ask of me. And right. um, all my workshops are done on a donation basis, just like my healing work. Great. And, and Jason just put in the chat a link to Grace's website, and I'm sure we'll put it in one more time before the end of the hour. Many questions. Here's a, a question from Elisa. Uh, Elisa, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, Hi, Grace. I am a reconnecting indigenous person, descendant of the Yoemi tribe. I would like to know if you have any advice for people who grew up disconnected from the traditions but are interested in reconnecting. Yes, my Yoemiya. Um, we uh, are very blessed that we have a lot of Yoeme relatives who are willing to share um, and are open to sharing with all of us to bring us back into, into our communities. Um, one of my dear relatives, Olympia Beltran, has uh, started a Yaquis of Southern California, a nonprofit of which I'm the treasurer this year. It's brand new. And I encourage you to go to our Facebook page. We are connecting with other Yoemia um, here in the United States. And we are all going to be offering some platicas on, on culture, there's language classes that are free that are offered on Zoom by Maestro Cesar Barreras. I encourage you to attend them. Uh, usually we have that information also on the Yaquis of Southern California Facebook page. Um, that's, a, that's where you should start. That's where you should start. There's, we'll be giving more resources there and we welcome everyone to learn the language, whether you're Yaqui or you're not, but, um, Definitely, we want to encourage all of our UMEA to come and reconnect with our culture, to reconnect with our language. I'm learning the language along with everybody else. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you'll feel welcomed. Oh, beautiful. Thank you for that. I, and I know she appreciates it as well. Karen has an interesting question. She wants to know if you can talk about the differences between creation light and sustaining light or particle energy and divine light? I don't know if any of that uh, rings a bell for you. No, no, it doesn't. Okay, great. Sorry. And then there are several questions about whether you work with the elements or not, uh, and how, if you do, um, in your practice. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not sure what if you mean by the elements. Are in you, this case, uh, but, earth, water, fire, air, fire, ether is what they are talking absolutely. about. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. I think that is also a, a, a connection that we have across cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in England a few years ago and I connected with a beautiful woman who's very much a part of her culture there that we talked about the elements and how that works uh, for them. You know, it's a magic system. Ours, we call it medicine. So um, the medicine that I uh, had, the tobacco, the sage, earth, right? Mm -hmm. um, on my altar, I always have water. I have a gopal burning when I'm doing my prayers. Um, the different, the flowers, of course, also represent our spiritual world, uh, the earth world, uh, um, especially in the Yaki tradition, flowers are, are very important to us. Um, so I have flowers. There's other thing, elements on my uh, on my altar that um, are important to me uh, in my in my path. So yes, I do work with the elements in that way. That I honor the elements because we are the elements. The elements are in us, mm -hmm. and so we're that micro and macrocosm, right? So in, in honoring the elements, there's an, uh, we honor ourselves. There, again, there's that interconnectedness. There's the um, interdependence and there's the reciprocity. So I'm not sure if that's exactly what you were asking me, but I hope that that helped a little bit. 
I love that. And I love what you just mentioned about the interdependence and reciprocity relates to a question who, uh, that Joyce set, asked about, um, you know, can you comment on the bonding community of people, plants and animals who live depending on each other and, you know, how that fits into what you do. And I think you've just described that um, pretty well, right? Absolutely, because part of the reciprocity um, and generosity is not only monetary. Um, it's the reciprocity, like I think I mentioned earlier, it's the reciprocity that I hold for any guardian when I travel. Uh, before I travel, I always offer prayers and I put down offerings for the spirits of the land. If, uh, we went to Iceland a few years ago where I did a presentation and my husband was teaching. And I did my usual where I uh, made offerings and I said prayers to the guardians of the air, our guardians of the earth, of the water, um, and particularly to the guardians of place for Iceland. Mm -hmm. And that, um, that night I had a dream of these unusual looking dolphins and they were very excited to see me. And I thought that was really interesting. So I remembered what they looked like. So I did a Google search and those, uh, those dolphins were from Iceland in that area. Oh, so yeah. I knew that those guardians had heard my prayers and were already welcoming me to their sacred land. That's reciprocity. That's being a good relative. And that's also, you know, honoring um, the way back relations and connections that we probably all have way back. And so when we do that, we're honoring them, we're honoring ourselves, we're honoring your ancestors, their ancestors, my ancestors. And I hope that in doing that, that's also bringing healing to, to the ancestors. I love and that. that. That ripples out to us. I love that. And, and it so relates to Margaret's question, which is, would you consider that at some level we're all global relatives, right? And I think you just Absolutely. gave an example of, of how you can be a good relative and how you can facilitate reciprocity and how you get that knowing back when you made contact in that way. I and mean, what a beautiful uh, experience you just shared with us. Mm -hmm. Grace, thank you so much for this hour. It's just been fantastic. I know y'all, there are some questions about, can I get this replay later? Yes, absolutely. This is freely available. This is part of the work of our social profit or nonprofit collaborative, the consciousness and healing initiative. And by way of you know, our, our abilities to facilitate reciprocity, we are able to have this freely available to everyone for the next 48 hours. So all weekend, feel free to watch this again, feel free to share it with friends. And in that spirit of reciprocity, the reason that we can do these things is because we have an incredible staff that works really hard in organizing and facilitating these events, along with, of course, the very deep generosity of our presenters. So if this really calls to you and you want to dive in and learn more about the different healing traditions, the science behind the healing traditions, I encourage you to look at becoming a Chi contributor. It's super easy. Jason is going to pop in into the chat um, how you can become a contributor. You simply go to chi.is forward slash join. When you do that, You'll not only be supporting us to be able to continue to have these webinars for the community, you'll get all access to every single webinar we've done. And there are about 50 of them with so many leaders in the healing space. It's just an incredible treasure trove for your own well being and your own learning. And I won't share too much now, but we have some really fantastic offerings that are coming up soon for all of you. And she contributors are going to get an amazing discount to that. So it's just our way of saying thank you. And we invite you also to support in this movement toward global healing. Once again, Grace, if people would like to be in contact with you directly, what are the best ways to learn more from you? You can just sign up on my email list or contact me through info at curanderismo.org. Just go to my website and uh, click on the contact tab. It'll take you to a, to a form or just send me an email. Okay. That's wonderful. Well, wishing you all well. Thank you for all joining us today, being wonderful allies and relatives, listening to this very deep and beautiful and valuable and very important conversation with Grace. More to come, I hope. And thank you all. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Thank you.